So right now we'll move on to the next session. Our next session is on the wholesale banking, the new platform. Uh, this is going to be presented by Vivek Gupta, President of Wholesale Banking Products, and Neeraj Gambhir, RG for Global Markets. Neeraj, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vijit. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, just can we have the recording? Okay. So just a quick recap, uh, on the wholesale banking side, we have articulated in the past our ambition to be uh, the best digital corporate bank in the country. Uh, some of the key call outs from the last uh, presentation was that we are, Project NEO is our expression of that. Uh, it's, it's a bunch of things that we are doing across the back end, the front end, the processes, etc. cetera. Uh, Leading plank on Project NEO was APIification of our journeys on transaction banking uh, and leveraging partnerships to deliver growth um, and to drive digital transaction banking outcomes. Uh, an industry leading corporate and MSME digital banking platform. And this required a whole bunch of things to be done, including some of the stuff on the back end, upgrading of the systems, new build outs, and some reimagining re -imagining some of the propositions on the corporate and the MS MSME side. What we are going to do today is uh, continue to demonstrate that what we are building out is indeed a good product market fit. Uh, the number of customers and the kind of engagement that we are having with these customers using Neo platform. Uh, what have been the outcomes so far and what has this done to our market share in this space. Um, we also would like to update you on what's happening on the corporate and MSME digital platforms. Uh, one of them has actually gone live in the last quarter. And some of the other uh, initiatives that we've taken on the digitization space and the partnerships that we've built with uh, fintechs and some of the other players in this space. So uh, if you look at the left-hand uh, side uh, chart, uh, it's effectively an expression of uh, how we are actually trying to tackle this using our own platform uh, and uh, integration journeys that our corporate customers take with us or the partners take with us. Uh, Neo for business and Neo for corporate is the expression of our own channels and our platforms. And the API journeys using Neo Rails is effectively where we impact the integration with the customers and the integration with the partners. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we are almost at the end of build out for our API journeys. Uh, APIification of our journeys, and we believe that we have the best in class uh, as far as the API proposition for transaction banking is concerned. We have roughly 125 plus transaction banking journeys which have been APIified. Uh, it is uh, it is sort of uh, helped with the uh, presence of a corporate developer platform. It's a sandboxed developer platform that. Uh, customers can use themselves. This is again one of the best in class developer platform that we have put in place. Uh, and it allows an end to end digital sort of experimentation by the savvy digital savvy customers. Uh, we have evidence market leadership in the segments of focus. Uh, and there is a whole lot of focus and attention being paid to making sure that the corporate customers who want to integrate using our Neo platforms are assisted in the process and it's a very speedy process for them. Uh, it's not something that they end up spending a lot of time. So in terms of helping them make the transition from traditional ways of integrating with the banks to API way of integrating with the banks is something which we are also paying a lot of attention to. And some of the work that we have done has of course won uh, a bunch of accolades across uh, across various uh, folks who take, keep, your, keep a track of this. We are not content in basically confining ourselves to Neo alone. That is a key plank for sure. But this slide actually talks to three examples, right, where we have either used Neo Rails or we have innovated at scale. Let me talk to each of these three examples very briefly. On the left-hand side, you will see mention of Access Receivable Suite. So let me step back here. Imagine any company today in India, and there are hundreds, thousands very large companies which are in the distribution business. They sell to a raft of customers, very large customers, very small customers. These customers pay them through a multitude of means, NAFT, RTGS, checks, etc., etc. There are established business practices which are antiquated, right? So look, I think the intent here was for us to say, how do I bring, how does Axis bring 
and we have done this now with a number of clients, artificial intelligence, machine learning capability to actually simplify the entire collection mechanism end to end for this customer's distribution ecosystem, right? So collect efficiently, do the recon efficiently, reduce the day sales outstanding, right? Uh, this also basically tackles problems which were hitherto not being tackled through propositions. That includes part payments. I mean, in the customer's real world, you get discounts. There are part payments. All of those need to be reconciled. There are large shared service centers that customers run, which has a cost element to it. So bringing that all together is through the ARS uh, proposition. More importantly, the ARS proposition tackles, if you think about it from a customer's lens, a CFO agenda and a sales agenda. A CFO agenda from reducing day sales outstanding, making it more efficient working capital. A sales agenda meaning you're selling to distributors who need financing, we can grow your sales, right? So this is integrated digitally in the truest sense of the word. I'll quickly talk about the middle piece, which is uh, B2B collections. Now look, uh, we, we have solved this for a very large household name in the FMCG space. The problem statement here was very simple. We are dealing with thousands of wholesalers and millions of retailers. So let's talk about scale. Thousands of wholesalers, millions of retailers, very little visibility at the head office as to the demand parameters. Very little visibility in the head office as to if I pass a discount, what is the effect of the discount? Right? Of course, there is collection of money and how is that flowing through in efficiency and what have that. So look, I think we put the solution together, uh, generally industry leading, because here we have embedded ourselves. We have not designed a system on a standalone basis. We have embedded ourselves through agility into the existing client systems. So their ecosystem does not need to change. Minimal change in the client's ecosystem. We are able to onboard their retailers, their wholesalers, and provide a composite digital collection solution. And we will end up being the whole, the sole collection bank for this very, very large corporate, right? So again, this also talks to both the CFO and the, and the sales agenda, as I spoke earlier, uh, on both efficiency and working capital, as well as growing sales. Last one on corporate bill payments. Uh, Look, this talks to the simplification and efficiency agenda, right? So imagine here, large company has a shared service centers operating in multiple locations of the country, has to make payments across various state taxes, utilities. Uh, there's a governance aspect here, various bills have to be fetched. So solving a real pain point that exists across a multitude of clients. And we've kind of gone live with almost close to 100 customers now as we speak. Uh, and this is bringing significant efficiencies uh, from a payments point of view, from a recon point of view, from a governance point of view. So this is resonating well in the marketplace again, but talking to digitization outside of new and at times using new rails. This was a slide actually, which we had telegraphed to you last year. Uh, this is about scaling up partnerships. Uh, we had mentioned that uh, we were building our supply chain business in partnership uh, with Credible. Uh, the good thing is, uh, just to be consistent with last year, we have grown our uh, decently large supply chain book, uh, almost 70% uh, in terms of average book size. Uh, we have clearly evolved our proposition much further, much further, which is reflecting in the numbers. Uh, we are here able to now play on both sides of a given client. So the testimony that you have from Bajaj Electricals is actually saying that access is now both on the receivable side as well as the payable side, right? And if you think about what the client actually needs, I need a visibility sitting in the middle as to what's happening on both sides, right? I need this to be integrated with my ERP. I need it to be digitally available. My distributors, if you look at the right-hand side of, of, uh, of the slide, my distributors need to be credit approved within an hour. They need to be offered a digital distributor finance proposition uh, through email, which can be then documentation light. So look, all those things have kind of worked well through. Uh, we have a number of uh, wins here, but uh, the testimony here is the size of the book, and we're continuing to win at scale. The last slide out here is uh, a very traditional product, uh, bank guarantees. Now, this is important here because, look, we have worked very closely uh, with a very premier client like Gale in the PSU space and with Swift to solve for a problem that actually hadn't been looked at and solved at scale at all. 
In this case, this is about bank guarantees on the advising side, right? How do we make sure that a company today which is operating, Gale in this case, in multiple locations, is the recipient of guarantees, right? How are these guarantees not lying in drawers? They're actually mapped into the client's ERP, SAP, et cetera. How are they managed for risk management much more efficiently, uh, completely paperless for sure? Uh, and most importantly, the CFO on the treasury function is having an end-to-end -end visibility into the underlying business. Right. So, look, this is all about using ISO standards here, working very closely with a very large premier client, uh, plug into their ERPs, and a scalable offering at that. This also, I think, stitches well together with the bank guarantee issuance product. So we are now present on both the issuance side as well as uh, the advising side of the business. So in conclusion, um, look, well positioned uh, as a best-in-class uh, digital corporate bank, um, the numbers are flowing through from a liability and a fee income perspective. Customer experience, clearly there is a step up. Uh, we're also making sure as we go through this journey, we are future-proofing our tech stack to make sure resiliency and the scale expectations. Uh, you heard phone pay, uh, the customer basically saying, deep saying, look, the scale expectations are X. So how do we basically make sure we are in step with those scale expectations? It's taken us about three years uh, to get here. Uh, we've rolled Neo out in stages. Um, Look, we think we have a differentiated proposition in the marketplace. We are winning, as I've shared. Um, we therefore have a competitive advantage. Um, it's not easy to replicate. Um, and we believe we've just got started. So lots to follow. Um, thanks again for, for uh, hearing Neeraj and me out. And look forward to having some of you at the Experience Zone. J just a couple of points I'd like to add here before we ask, answer your questions. One is that uh, when we started the new journey, it was a little bit abstract in terms of what are we trying to build here. I think today we have a very clear articulation and expression of what we've built in APIification, on the mobile app, on the uh, internet banking uh, you know, platform journeys, etc. cetera. Uh, if you think about this, APIification might seem very simple or might, everybody might be talking about it, but what is required at the back end to be able to deliver these journeys on the transaction banking side is not an easy, easy task. You've got to completely recast your back end for this. So even if somebody starts today, and we've been on this journey for almost two and a half, three years now, even if somebody starts today, it will take them easily 18 to 24 months at, at least to catch up with where we are. So I think we have through this process, we have built a significant head start for ourselves in terms of where we are, in terms of our tech capability, our ability to sort of give these solutions to the customers. And we've just started. Uh, the, the customer engagement has just started, and I think as customers experience more and more of this, we are very confident that this will scale up reasonably well, and this will be a source of a good liability and fee generation for us uh, today. Second. Even though what we've built, particularly in the API space, is best in class, uh, we are not stopping here. We, we are already in the process of thinking through Neo 2, and maybe there'll be a Neo 3 down the line sometime, but it is a start of a journey for us, and we are seeing success, and we will continue to sort of go down this path even more. There are a lot of ideas, there are a lot of thoughts that we have as to how we can take these entire journeys and progresses, uh, platforms uh, significantly higher. Our core thesis here is, that to be a successful digital bank, to be the best in class, and by best in class, I just don't mean what we're doing here in India, but when we started this journey, we benchmark ourselves with the best in class across the globe. To be a best in class, what we need to have is a very, very efficient, uh, self-serving platform for the customers, which is integrated across what they do in corporate banking, whether it is trade, whether it is cash management, whether it is FX and markets, or any other product they're dealing with the bank. And I think we are well on our way to develop a very, very wholesome proposition for our customers. Thank you. Happy to take your questions. Uh, too many hands, okay. Uh, I think Suresh, after a long time, Suresh, go ahead. You know, in the previous cycle, uh, of course, Axis was a big uh, participant in the um, in the large ticket infrastructure projects and the corporate capex cycle. So. Is there a change in view of the organization with respect to funding some of the possible future infrastructure projects? Of course, we are seeing a lot of PLI-related um, initiatives being taken by the government. Uh, somehow, it looks like banks this cycle are a bit more risk-averse, right, with respect to this. And um, yeah, we just wanted a view on that. Yeah. 
So obviously the banks have had a lot of learning in the past cycle, right? Particularly with regard to long gestation projects like infrastructure. But you know, as a bank, we are like, uh, we started this commentary and Amitabh mentioned that we are a full service wholesale bank, right? We are working with our customers across the liability stack, including capital that they need to raise. And uh, what we've built in the wholesale bank is obviously we have our own balance sheet to lend, uh, which we do depending upon our own risk appetite. But we also have ability to syndicate these loans. We also have ability to raise bond market funding for these projects if, you know, if they reach a certain stage. We have the ability to raise capital for them. So today when we talk to the customers, we're not just talking about our own balance sheet. We're basically talking what can we do for you from a full stack perspective. Uh, there is obviously a lot of learning that the bank has taken in the previous cycle about how we want to sort of, uh, what kind of exposures we are comfortable taking. And there is a certain degree of conservatism that has set in in the system as a whole, which I think is getting reflected now. But I think there is a learning that government has also taken from this. So for exa a classical example is how NHEI is going about the funding of the road projects, right? So they have changed the model and that has helped the banking system to finance that a lot better, in a lot better way. So I think it's a, it's a process. Uh, as we see cash flows, as we see maturity of these projects, the funding structures will evolve. Initial stage may involve more risk taking by the banks, depending upon what the, what the segment is. But as these projects mature, we are also looking at how we can actually refinance them through bond market route or through capital market route. And that's happening, by the way. Uh, a, lot of these a lot of these borrowers who are, for example, in renewable energy space, are today coming to refinance themselves in the bond market and we are engaged with them. So our, our thought process here is that there is a full stack that we need to deal with. There will be segments where there will be higher riskiness that we will be obviously conservative about. But there are segments where there is now enough evidence of cash flows and you know the, uh, the, the risk has actually been understood much better and obviously we will engage with them. And the extension is on the PLI and of course also in the ESG narrative in all these projects. So you you have a particular mandate there, a particular criteria from an ESG standing. Very, very bottoms up approach uh, uh, in terms of how we deal with these each of these sectors. Obviously the individual borrower, their profile, the promoter quality, the quality of the project, the cash flows, all of this go into the decisioning. Uh, PLI is basically a government's expression of where they want the capital to flow in, right? Uh, and if the capital doesn't, by the way, there is, it's still an early stage of to say whether PLI is success or not. I think one or two sectors have seen uh, the maximum impact of PLI. But as PLI evolves, as we see that in those sectors, what kind of uh, sort of capital flows in, what kind of promoters come into the sector, what kind of balance sheet they're willing to commit, what kind of their own capital they're willing, willing to bring in, obviously we will evolve as these things, we, we will evaluate as these, these things evolve. No, I, I think Abhishek was there. I'll take Abhishek second, yeah. yeah thanks, Abhijit. Um, so uh, my question is, what is the current client coverage of new for business or new for corporates uh, that you have? I think you showed in one slide that you've onboarded 10,000 clients or so. Uh, what is the overall client coverage? How quickly can you onboard clients? How much time does it take? And therefore, maybe in a year's time, where would this coverage, or where would you like to see this coverage? Yeah, I, I don't want to put out a forward guidance on what we will do, but I'll just give you a color on what we have managed to achieve so far. Uh, I think on, so there are multiple parts to this, uh, this question. One is that with the large corporates, what we are able to achieve. So with the large corporates, we tend to think of NEO as a rail, because it's an API. So effectively, we integrate with the customer using API. Each customer has a slightly different way of doing business, and we have to sort of then make sure that what we are doing with them fits their, their business. We have engaged with a large number of top corporates in this. Different customers have chosen to integrate with us in different parts, and we are actually working with them. I think it's, it's triple digit numbers currently where we are fully engaged with the customers, and we are, in many cases, we are live. Uh, the 10,000 number that you saw was more on the MSME space. These are small traders, these are small uh, you know, businessmen who are effectively who are using NEO for business as a way of sort of experiencing us for the first time and they are basically using NEO for business to bring more of their business on this app and see how they can manage payments, collections, etc. Uh, the numbers could look very different on both the sides because the MSME space is very large. It's a large addressable space that we are looking at. It goes into millions and we've just started. So this can actually scale up fairly well. Large corporates is much more of a discussion of how do we use this technology space 
to help solve their problems. I mean, for example, Gale. Let me just go back to the, just give you a flavor of how it works. Gale, when they started on the EBG journey, we were one of the five or six banks that they engaged. The rest you can figure out whom they have engaged. It took everyone about six to nine months of discussion to say what they want to do. Access was the first bank to deliver them an end-to-end -end EBG solution which was fully functional. And many other banks have not yet crossed that hurdle. And the reason why we were able to do that was because we had the back end to be able to deliver that solution to them. So I think the reason I'm talking about Gale is because we gave the testimonial to you. It's in public space. The others, it's not in public space, so we can't talk about it. But there is a very deep integration that, required, that, that is required. And what NEO has done is it has helped us sort of make that process faster and also give, in many cases, unique solutions which are not possible with the previous technology stack. I hope that answers your question.